I'm Louise Goodman and I'm a motorsport reporter for ITV. I don't actually know where my love of cars came from. I think I just came out with it, to be honest. I, as a kid, I remember, you know, one of my biggest thrills as a sort of four or five year old was being allowed to park the car in the garage. Um, and even before that, as a tiny wee thing, I remember going on picnics and I'd sit on my dad's knee and he'd do the pedals and, and I'd sort of do the steering wheel around, you know, different fields in, in the new forest. And so I just, I just always love things with, with wheels and an engine. I never actually set out to have a career in motorsport. I mean, as a teenager, you know, a lot of my misspent youth was misspent on the back of a motorbike and all my mates were into cars and bikes and, and I, I loved them, but it was, wasn't as if I ever set out to work in the industry. It really came about by a, a set of happy circumstances. I actually started out working in powerboat racing and that was through um, friends of mine as a teenager. There was a guy called Steve Curtis who's possibly one of the sort of most prolific world champions that the you know British world champions that, that nobody's ever heard of. He's an eight times, I think, world offshore powerboat champion. They had a facility out in Fort Lauderdale in the States where they built their boats. Cougar Marine was the name of the company. So I went out to stay with them and whilst I was there, I met the editor of a powerboat racing magazine. And I, I, I went down to the world championships um, in Key West with her and kind of acted as her photographer, really. When I came back from the States, um, Roz, the, the editor of the magazine, offered me a job. So that was really my, my entree into journalism and into the, into the racing world as well. I actually started out selling advertising, but quickly realised I was no good at that. I remember phoning, you know, I'd phone people up and say, oh, do you want your, your normal advert this month? And they'd say, oh, things are, things are a bit tight this monthly, so we won't have it. And I'd sort of say, oh, okay then, put the phone down. Um, so I switched over onto the editorial side, which I loved, and that's really where, you know, I got all my journalistic training on the job, so, um, and worked my way up until I was editor of the magazine. Through that, I met a guy called Tony Jardine, um, and it was when I was coming to the end of my time with Powerboat Motor Skiing Magazine. I was planning to go away travelling and was looking for a sort of an easier job for a bit so I could sort my travels out. He was actually doing the PR for the Virgin Atlantic Challenge and we met at a mutual friend's barbecue and I overheard him saying that he was going out on his own, he was setting up his own agency and um, was looking for somebody to come and, and work with him. So. I kind of had a word in his ear and said, listen, I'm around, it's only going to be for a couple of months because I'm off on my travels. But Tony said, well, that's, that's great. So, so I started off, I was presented with a, with a box with a computer in it and, and a desk and, and that was it, away we went. And it was through Tony that I got the entree into motor racing. He had a long history of working in motorsport. Tony looked after the main, uh, the Lotus sponsorship and I was in charge of looking after they, what they called their ancillary sponsorship. So they sponsored, they had a sort of a, smaller sponsorship of, of quite a range of teams. So I was assigned to look after all of those drivers. So we had people like Ricardo Patrese was one of the drivers. Alessandro Nanini was the one who used to scare the bejesus out of me because I was a young girl, you know, didn't really know motorsport that well, um, suddenly found myself in a Formula One paddock. Um, and, and he just used to have fun teasing me, basically. So I'd have to go and get his quotes at the end of qualifying and at the end of the race. And, and he'd always sort of be a bit flirtatious with me. And I just didn't, I didn't know where to look. I didn't know where to put myself. He absolutely terrified me. The guy who'd been the MD for Late in the House, a guy called Ian Phillips, then went to work for Eddie Jordan when Eddie was coming into Formula One. I'd obviously come across Eddie through his, he had camel sponsorship in uh, Formula 3000 with Martin Donnelly and, and Jean Alesi, and I'd done a couple of, couple of races with them. Then I was approached about moving to, to Jordan. So I had the big sort of left London, where I'd you know, lived for many years at that point, um, and, and headed up to the sticks, up, up here to what seemed like the sticks anyway, to, to Oxfordshire, uh, and started working for, for Eddie. So Ian Phillips was the marketing director. I was the, well, I was the media department, basically. It was, it was just me. Everybody got involved in, in everything. I mean, you know, even down in the race shop in those days, everybody could do a bit of, you know, a bit of wet layup, you know, a bit of machining. It, it's become far more specialised. It was a brilliant place to work. And of course, never a dull moment with Eddie, who could be, I mean, he was great fun. He could be a total pain in the arse at times, though. The times we had to just shout at him and 
send him out. If he was bored, that was the problem. If he didn't have enough to do, he'd just come and interfere. So there'd be the three of us sitting in the office next door to Eddie's. There was Lindsay, Eddie's PA, myself and Ian. And he would, he'd just come in and start shuffling things on his desk and total pain in the butt. Lindsay was quite good at keeping him under control though. Jordan had very much an atmosphere of, it was a kind of work hard, play hard kind of atmosphere. So yeah, we put in the hours on the work side, but we, we enjoyed ourselves as well. We were kind of the people who started the, what's now become a massive, great big sort of post-race party at, at the British Grand Prix. And that really came about because the traffic back in those days, it was impossible to get out of Silverstone. So we decided that we would, we get a rock and roll band together. Um, so Eddie called up a few of his mates. He had a few mates sort of in the industry. I think we had Nick Mason play with us on a couple of occasions. Nick Mason from Pink Floyd. We had um, one of the guys from the, who played with Chrissy Hind and the Pretenders and um, Eddie on the drums, of course. We generally had two drum kits just so that there was actually somebody keeping time just in case Eddie, he's got a lot better these days, I have to say, he's much better. But uh, yeah, so we would roll this flatbed truck in and then we'd kind of set up this, after the Grand Prix, we'd set up this, this makeshift band. Various different drivers, Johnny Herbert always used to come up on stage. Damon, who's quite a good guitarist, he'd get up on stage and, and play. Um, and we'd have this like sort of massive great area outside our, our motorhome. It was heaving one Sunday night after, I can't remember which, which year of the Grand Prix it was. Um, and I can remember Bernie walking past, and of course every team only had a certain amount of parties available. I remember Bernie walking past and uh, just looking at the hundreds of people sitting outside our motorhome area, and who clearly we didn't have enough passes for them. We'd been doing the usual, you know, bring somebody in, take the pass off, take it out to the next person, put that on, bring it in. We had a hundred there, and Bernie just walked past, saw all these people, just shook his head, and. Carried on walking. <laughs> I've never, I've never really collected much memorabilia. I suppose when you're out there doing the job, you can't like stop and take photos and get autographs and stuff. But, but I've got all of my passes from, well, I guess all my Formula One passes and all the events that I've worked on. So, I'm, I look, I'm aging myself here. These are all the really old ones. 1990. I was just about 12 when I started in the sport. You understand? So that's Leighton, Leighton House. God, look at that picture. Don't look at that picture, actually. What else have we got here? So some of the, that looks like another old one. Oh, that's, that's the early days of ITV, that. 1997, so that was my first, first season with ITV. What else have we got in here? I think these are, that's Goodwood. Yep, that's the Drivers Club at, uh, at the Goodwood um, Festival. So that was always a really good one to get because that when you can go to the sort of backstage area where, uh, where all the drivers are hanging out. That's, a, that's typical Eddie Irvine. We were, um, that picture came into the office. So Eddie said, oh, send that to Bernie Eccleston as a Christmas card. So he wrote to Bernie, I hope to see you at the first race. By the way, where is it? <laughs> Happy Christmas. I worked with quite a lot of drivers during the time at Jordan. I mean, there was one year, 1993, I lost count of how many drivers we had in the car back in those days. You, you know, you could, you could swap and change drivers as you can't now. So. Along came Eddie Irvine, who at the time had been racing out in uh, Japan in the Formula 3000 Championship in Japan. The last two races then were Japan and Australia. Eddie made his, his debut at the end of 93 um, with the Jordan team, which was an extremely memorable debut because that was the race where um, he got lumped by, um, by Ayrton Senna. So he was actually running quite high up the grid. Um, Ayrton Senna came up to, to lap him overtook Eddie and then and sat behind Damon. And of course, as far as Eddie was concerned, that was interrupting his, his battle. So he unlapped himself, which Ayrton didn't take kindly to and came to visit Eddie um, in our, our team office afterwards. Um, and, and Eddie being Eddie, just sat there cross-legged like a little leprechaun on the table and, and took, you know, told Ayrton, who was saying, I was faster than you, and Eddie was saying, well, if you were faster, then I wouldn't be able to overtake you, would you? And Ed and just, just lost it and, and, and punched out at him. So Eddie, his arrival on the scene was, was instantly even more memorable. So the following year, it was, it was Eddie who already had this reputation alongside um, Rubens Barrichello for the, for the full season. And they, that was a very interesting dynamic because Rubens had always been the youngest. He was Rubinho, he, he'd always been 
you know, the youngest driver on the grid. Different drivers like to be treated in different ways. Rubens kind of likes to be cuddled. He likes to feel loved to, to get the best out of him. Eddie has always worked on the basis of psychologically undermining any driver that he can. And he just got into Rubens' head like he can't believe. And I think when Rubens, he then moved on and, and went to, to race with Paul Stewart Racing um, when they came in um, Stuart Grand Prix into Formula One. And I think Jackie kind of put his head back together. Jackie Stewart put his head back together. And it was, you know, Rubens became, a, I guess, a better driver as a result of it. But I think it was a painful process that, that he went through. So it was while I was working for, for Eddie that I was approached to go and, and work for ITV and that led to some really interesting times. Um, I suppose one of the most memorable of those was being in not only the first ever race for two-seater Formula One cars, but the first ever crash for two-seater Formula One cars. Definitely a day I'll never forget. So Minardi had um, a fleet of two-seater cars and they decided that they were going to have a race for these, for these two-seater cars. And uh, so all off we went to Donington, um, Paul Stoddard said to me, would I, you know, would I like to have a go? Well, it didn't take me long to say yes for that. Paul, bless him, I felt it slightly guilty because he'd initially said, oh, you can be the passenger in my car. But one of the Minardi drivers at the time was Fernando Alonso. And I thought that that kid's good. I think he might go on to do some. I'd really like to be in the back of his car. So I said to Paul, would you, would you mind if I went in Fernando's car? Paul said, no, that's fine. So it was slightly staged. Um, we all, all of the drivers had to come in and do a pit stop. And the plan was that Nigel would win the race because obviously from a PR perspective, that would, that would make a much better better story. But I think Fernando kind of wasn't really paying attention to how many laps we'd done. And I can remember coming down the back straight at Donington, we overtook Mansell, came around the final chicane, and Fernando then obviously saw the flag and thought, oh no, I'm going to be in trouble, I'm not supposed to win. So he lifted, Nigel was right behind us, just effectively didn't lift, I guess. And the first thing I knew about it, I just felt this almighty wham at the back of the car. And then I saw this thing up, up here, and realised that it was a Formula One car going backwards, kind of over my head. So um, it all happened in a flash. And in fact, I can remember Fernando, you know, obviously came to hold and I was thinking, mate, the line, we, we haven't, I was almost wanted to say, we haven't crossed the line yet. We're still in with the shout to win this race. Nobody was injured, thankfully. Uh, and in fact, the guy, um, I can't remember his name, the guy who was in the back of Nigel Mansell's car, who paid like a hundred thousand pounds for, for charity. It was all being done for charity. To, to get this this driver with Nigel Manson. He was just, oh, that is just the best thing ever. You know, he thought he'd seriously got his money's worth. So this is the rear wing end plate from the two-seater Minardi that, that I was in, the one that Mansell crashed into. So I thought actually that would make a really nice memento of the day. Got all the drivers to, or some of the drivers to sign it. That's Fernando down there, he signed it. Nigel, he did all the damage. Me a bit of Formula One car. Working in motorsport, I'd, I'd always been a bit of a petrol head and um, but nobody ever says do you want to come and drive my car until when you're on television suddenly say people say would you like to have a go at driving our car so I'm working for ITV and I was approached by Ford who said would I be interested in in having a go driving the car so yeah I absolutely would and my first event I headed off to to Jersey with my little Ford car to do the Jersey rally and as I was going down I could see these blokes kind of jumping up and down and waving with a big banner in front of them. And it was only when I got closer, I realised that this banner said, Hello Louise. So I kind of thought, well, I can't really wave. I've got a corner to be coping with here. But I didn't cope with it brilliantly well. So I actually ran a bit wide, clipped the banking. Everything was fine, carried on. Left a, obviously, cut a bit of a chunk out of the banking. And as I came down, I could see these blokes again. Same guys were there. They turned the banner around, but they'd written on it, Louise was here with an arrow down to the section of the, of the banking that I'd, uh, that I'd taken out. Thanks, boys. This is my, as you can see, rather small trophy collection. A few other, a few other cars thrown in as well. This is one of the, this is a rallying one, the Ford Car Championship. First Lady Driver. I always used to joke when they gave me that, because I was like, so what, First Lady Driver, big deal. You know, that doesn't, doesn't mean anything. And then they said, oh, there's a check that goes with it. Thank you very much, I'll, I'll take that. This is the, this is the proper, this is the real McCoy. This is my 
third in class on Network Rally GB. Louise Goodman and Morris Hamilton, 82nd overall. Not too bad, I suppose. That was, that was quite something actually, crossing the finish ramp and standing up on the, uh, you know, on the sort of ceremonial finish ramp and getting our trophy. Rallying has to be the only sport where the likes of a novice like me is competing on the same stage at the same time as the best people in the world. So all of these great experiences that I had, the, the Minardi race, the, the rallying, basically all came about through the fact that I was, I was now working for ITV. Um, and that was a real shift in, in my career. I mean, that was something that I'd never dreamed of working in television. Mac One approached me, they wanted to have a girl on the team to reflect the fact that there are a lot of women out there who are interested in motorsports. So it was a difficult time. The first six months, you know, I can remember coming home from the races and just crying and thinking, oh my God, this is terrible, I can't do this. And, and every now and then uh, somebody reminds me, Bradley Lord, the, the head of communications at Mercedes, delightfully reminds me every now and then, I remember watching your first Grand Prix and I just think, no, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear about it, I don't want to hear about it. Um, because it, well, I was, I was quite pretty, pretty bad. I mean, the reason they employed me, they didn't clearly didn't employ me for my broadcasting skills. They employed me because I knew Formula One, I knew the people to talk to, I knew the questions to ask them, I knew all the drivers, I knew the people on the teams, and they really were my saviors because the drivers, particularly, who were the ones that I was doing the interviews with, were so great. They, they could tell. Most people could tell probably from the fact my hand was shaking with the microphone in it, and my voice was all high, but. Um, they were brilliant, so they cut me a lot of slack. In my early days of working for ITV, my, my then agent said, oh, how do you feel about writing a book? And I kind of thought, well, they do say everybody has a book in them. And I'd kind of come up with this idea of doing it on a chapter by chapter, so each chapter would be a race, and I'd talk about a different things. The stuff that I think when you work in the paddock, you see everything going on, you know, the things that fans don't get to see and that they were fascinated to learn about, but just the minute of the day-to-day -day life, how it all works. Obviously, I'd started it late, so it's almost like I'm doing like two races between every race. Um, and I'd go and sit in my office at eight o'clock in the morning and just kind of write all day and sit in the office till 10 o'clock, go to bed, get up, repeat. It was, it was torture, to be quite frank. Could get much further removed from, uh, from motorsport, living here in the countryside. And dog walking. It's perfect. Here you go, Ruby. Wait. We used to um, we, we'd do different little features in, in each of the programmes. So we kind of sat down and hatched a plan whereby I would actually train with the team throughout the course of the season and then this would culminate in this little feature that we do at the British Grand Prix. They would actually show me live doing the pit stop during the race. That was all brilliant until the week before the race I had a phone call um, from the team and said, um, Lou, I'm afraid there's a bit of a problem with this. We've had a conversation and we don't think, we can't compromise. And So of course I'm then in a situation where ITV have got this slot blanked out and we've got, we've got no feature now. So I thought, I'll phone, I'll phone me off mate. So I phoned Andrew Stevenson who had been a grubby little number two mechanic when I first met him at Jordan Grand Prix. Is, is now um, sporting director at Force India, but Andy's been with that team right through from, from the Jordan day. So I said, Andy, I've got this problem. Explain the situation. He said, yeah, yeah, do it with us. Just before the start of the race, I bumped into Steve-O um, and he said, oh, I've just told the engineers. They weren't there a bit. I said, what do you mean you've just told the engineers? He said, well, I didn't want to tell them earlier on. They just make a big fuss about it. So I just, I've just, just broken it to them now that you're doing this. Um, so yeah, the, the pressure was really on. Ironically, Jensen, whose tyre, you know, whose car I was going to be working on, he, he broke down, he didn't even do a pit stop. So it would have come to nothing had I stuck with the original plan of doing it with Honda. And I think I'm still the only woman who's ever taken part in a pit stop live during the Grand Prix. So my little claim to fame. So all my time of working for, for, for race teams and, and working for ITV, I think I missed one race because my sister decided early days of Formula One she'd get married on a race weekend um, very inappropriately but after that you know I never missed a race until sadly we came to the 2004 British Grand Prix when um, my partner John Walton um, we were down in London for the, um, the, the the teams were running a sort of promotional event around the streets I think the cars were driving 
um, running down Regent Street. So John Boy was a sporting director at Minardi. Um, and sadly, John Boy had a heart attack on the Monday night before, um, so this is the Monday night before the British Grand Prix. Um, and, and we had sort of four or five days of, of him being in, in hospital. Um, and then, you know, we realized he, he wasn't gonna make it and, and he died on the, on the Friday night. Um, and um, Paul Stoddart, bless him, had taken all the, the decals off the cars and then just put John Boy um, on, on the engine covers and, and on the rear wing. You know, thereafter, ITV said to me, if you want to take, if you want to come back for the next race, fine. If you want to miss the next four races, absolutely fine. Let us know what you want to do. But I just kind of thought, well, I, I've kind of got to, I've got to get back into the paddock. You know, the people that you meet, um, it's, it's not a job, it's a way of life. And, and it's a family, it's a motorsport family. And I, I just absolutely felt the motorsport family wrapping its arms around me then, which was just, just the, the loveliest thing. Where it goes from here on in, heaven only knows. I mean, obviously my, the media training is something I'm passionate about now. That's my, that's my baby. That's something that's in my control. But really, in terms of going forward, I just kind of want to carry on doing what I'm doing until nobody wants me anymore. And then I'll go and travel the world and see all the places I didn't get to see when I was traveling in my youth. So that's John Boy at the top, swinging champagne after a karting event. That was a life-size cutout of Nigel Mansell that was at the British Grand Prix one year. We, <laughs> we relieved them of it, whoever's it was. That's EJ, EJ Stenley. So the lovely Jim Bamber, who used to do, there used to be a cartoon in the front of all sport magazine every week. Jim did a few. This is the one he did for my, when I did the pit stop at, uh, at the British Grand Prix. And... <laughs> Hello again.